Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. Good morning, Family Church. So enthusiastic. I thought my grandma was that one. I said, good morning, family church. Good morning. There we go. That's a little bit better. That's a little better. I'll let that pass. Uh, this morning, I did not put my ribbon where it needs to be. So if you hang on, I'll have it in a sudden moment. Uh, real quick, I want to do uh, just a couple announcements really, uh, really quick before we get going, because I know y'all hate how long I take. <clears throat> I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Um, the quick tag. So the stuff on the back of your chair, um, I've seen a lot of people try to scan that like a QR code. That is not how that works. Uh, it's kind of like Google Pay and Apple Pay. All you have to do is, if you have an iPhone, it's kind of more near the top. As long as it's unlocked and you put the top on the card, it'll scan it. It's a, an NFT thing or whatever it's called. Uh, I remember when I had a Samsung, you could put it like anywhere on the back of the phone and it would, it would bring it up. And that'll bring up a web page that has a bunch of quick links for uh, the Connect cards. So we're not printing out Connect cards and buying those anymore uh, just to save money and especially because to save on waste for paper. Because, you know, I mean, if we don't recycle it, then it's just ending up in the trash. Or uh, some people have absolutely atrocious handwriting like myself, so we can't do anything with it. Uh, and then there's also a quick link on there for giving, and I want to take a moment and thank everybody that gives uh, to the church as, uh, as well. None of this happens without it. We've got a bunch of upgrades coming really soon for the sound, and then your giving remains faithful, the cameras. <clears throat> but uh, if, if you're not here and you've ever watched our live stream, you're kind of like, oh, it's, eh, you know, eh. it'll get a lot better, I promise, uh, in a few weeks when they come in and revamp everything and in here will sound better. I know sometimes it gets a little loud and there's weird kind of noises and stuff that goes on. So we're working on stuff. Uh, also today is food truck Sunday, which is always one of my favorite uh, days. And finally we have a barbecue truck and popsicles for the kids. So go broke and uh, <laughs> support a local business. Uh, this week, uh, this is, this is, I feel good. This is my third week. It's the three-peat. This is the, uh, the three-peat. And I don't know if that only applies to basketball because I don't really watch anything other than baseball. So uh, just give me like a Bryce Harper jersey and, and we'll be good. <clears throat> but uh, I know last week we were in Acts 2. And the week before that we were also in Acts 2 and 1. And I wanted to go to Acts 4, but uh, God changed it all of a sudden. So today, if you will, stand with me for the reading of the Word of God. We will be in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And if you're new here, we only stand for, for the sermon, not the entire thing. So if your feet hurt, I'm sorry. You'll be sitting down in a moment. In verse 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. I, 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 ain't, I ain't less than 40 days. I fast on Sunday mornings. I'm starving right now. <clears throat> the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. I think this one's hilarious. Showed him all, all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I'll give you all their authority and splendor, as if he's not talking to God already. And it's already belonging to him. And he says, it has been given to me, and <laughs> I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. 
If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And finally, verse 13, when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. If you have walked uh, with Jesus for more than 24 seconds, you've probably already dealt with some type of temptation and been tempted in some capacity. But uh, just as I was saying earlier, I thought, you know, we were going to be somewhere else. God, I think God led me to this passage this week to bring to you, because I think there's a lot of distractions that are not just here, but are also coming. Um, And I don't mean that in like some weird political thing. So if you think that's where this message is going, it's not. You can go somewhere else if you want to hear anything to do with politics. But I think that uh, God is warning us because the devil wants us distracted. He wants us to devote our time and attention to everything else under the sun instead of the sun above everything else. Mm. And you know, the only difference between those uh, two words is the letter U. So you get to decide where you're putting your attention. That's the Holy Spirit right there because that ain't in my notes. That was good. mm. I'll shout myself on that one. In a time where the internet can be having you uh, believe anything that they want you to in less than a minute with AI and uh, all the other deep fakes and all that fun stuff, I think God has given me a simple message to bring to you all today because the devil wants you distracted. And whether it is through social media or a blog, a newspaper headline or a broadcast on, uh, on the internet or on TV or commercial, or the enemy's throwing his chaos at you to tempt you, I want you to remember the title of this message a day and write it down. Save it on your playlist on YouTube or TikTok, whatever. The title today is Don't Read the Comments. Don't read the comments. Father, have your way and and speak through me. I'm I'm just a vessel. Let them hear exactly what they need to hear. Everybody said, Amen. amen. You can find your seats. Don't read the comments. If you've been on the, uh, the cesspool of social media at any point in time, you'll know that the comments section is about the craziest place that you can find yourself. And uh, I know some people, like Kelsey, my wife, she will avoid it like the plague and never read them. Some people on their videos, they even turn them off so they don't have to see anything. But if you're like me and you're a complete psychopath, you love the comments. I love the comments. Give me the drama. Spill me the tea. Just show it. I want to see everything in there. I want to I see how you own 16 yachts, but you're tweeting from your mama's basement. I want to see the stories of heartbreak and the stories of breakthrough. I want to see it all. Let me have your deepest, darkest secrets. Let me see the stupidity of people arguing over the absolute dumbest things on a video that's less than a minute long and you have no context whatsoever. Don't read the comments. I love it. I love it. I love the comments. I I won't even finish a video. You can send me a video and I probably won't even watch it. I'll click for it about five seconds and I'm already scrolling through seeing what people are saying about the comments. I don't know what it is. And obviously, as you know, on the internet, people love to... uh, I love how Mike Tyson puts it uh, the best, that social media has made people way too comfortable not getting punched in the face. And I don't condone violence, uh, but Jesus whipped people too. <clears throat> and unfortunately, nowadays, with, uh, with, with the internet at our fingertips on our phones, you can talk any kind of smack that you want to talk. You can comment anything you want to talk. And think you have no repercussions until some crazy dude that's on 4chan or something is going to track down your IP address and show up on your front doorstep. Oh, y'all didn't know about that kind of stuff. Yeah, you should be careful what you say on the internet. But, uh, you know, I I really don't get bothered by comments. When people make nasty comments, it doesn't really bother me. Uh, I guess I'm just, I'm I'm weird in that way. I know uh, you are not that way. You get super defensive. (laughs) Kelsey's like, I don't want to see what they say. I'm like, let me see it. Tell me what you hate about me. Does anybody remember, um, I promise we're getting to the Bible in a minute, so it all makes sense. Does anybody remember celebrities read mean tweets? Have you ever heard of that? 
And I'm not going to endorse whatever show that's on because I don't even remember now at this point. But uh, I had a couple down that I wanted to share with you. For those of you that don't know, this is a, uh, a, a part of a show where they get a celebrity that literally sits down in front of a camera and for our uh, completely twisted enjoyment, they read comments about themselves and tweets about themselves that people have made. And of course, they're absolutely horrible. Uh, so all of these I'm going to read, this is the actual person reading them out loud about themselves. The first one, <laughs> Michael Strahan's teeth are like are, are having a middle school dance where the boys stand on one side and the girls stand on the other. Does anybody know who David Blaine is, the magician from a while ago? He had to read one that said, David Blaine, <laughs> David Blaine's, David Blaine looks like his voice is putting his face to sleep. <laughs> and this one is great. Uh, Mumford and Sons. I don't know if you've heard of them. If you've heard one song, you've heard all of them. And this guy's tweeted and they had to read it. He said, I love how music takes you to another place. Like Mumford and Sons are playing at this restaurant right now. So now I'm, now I'm going to a different restaurant. <laughs> and Shaq read one, said, at Shaq, you in that Buick commercial, you know you don't fit in that Buick. <laughs> and in all in good fun, I'm not going to just talk about celebrities today. Uh, we had some... Here, I don't want to give attention to the wrong thing, but I just want you to understand how nasty the comments can be from people so we can get in this message. We had some on one of the, uh, the first messages that I gave. And as you see, I have a complete stuttering problem because my mouth gets so dry after playing drums. Somebody said, speaking isn't his strong suit. Thank you. Wasn't Moses's either. We had another one. I don't know if I want to read the whole... I won't, I'll give you the highlights. This was a review... I think it was like a one or two star review for our church on Google. This guy and his wife, they, they attended the church for two weeks in a row. The first Sunday was great. The father, Philip, spoke well and delivered a great message to the point. Everyone was super friendly. Y'all remember this one? Everyone was super friendly. I'm glad that y'all are friendly to the people that come into the house, especially when they're like this. This last weekend was okay, but will not return. I enjoy music, but I don't enjoy singing the same songs two weeks in a row. Y'all, the angel's been singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord for literally God only knows how long. So good luck. They, they went on to say, the son Jared preached the past weekend, and we ended up walking out, felt he didn't know when to end, and kept dragging something out that shouldn't. If the church is looking to build bigger in Elkton or Hastings, please have Philip preach and not retire. We cannot go back if Jared is going to be the future pastor. They said, I'm sorry at the end, you know, <laughs> all they were missing was like the LOL. When you say something mean to somebody, you're like, LOL, just kidding. And you're like, eh. I'll tell you, if y'all can't stand to come to church for an hour and a half or two hours and hear about Jesus, uh, heaven's going to be an absolute nightmare for you. <clears throat> and uh, we've also come to find out that since on the family room and I wear like T-shirts and hats, that I guess I'm going to hell and I'm dishonoring God's house and uh, I'm unqualified to preach. But I want you to know that I'm so thankful that God doesn't look on the outward appearance. He looks on the inside. And he is the one who gets to make all those calls. So where you have all of these other people telling you who, are, who is not a real Christian or a real pastor, it's refreshing to know that their opinion doesn't mean anything when they stand up next to what my God says, who he wants, and this section of the story that he is still writing. Don't read the comments. So we see in this text, Jesus has been led into the wilderness. He is full of the spirit, led by the spirit. And the devil, as we, if you've ever read this story, the devil's about to be making all kinds of comments. We just read it, so obviously you have read it. Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit and led by the Spirit. Full of the Holy Spirit and led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted, and, and the Greek word for tempted also means tested by the devil. And I know sometimes Scripture can look uh, and be a little bit uncomfortable, but all of the Bible is true, not, this, the, not just the parts that you agree with. All of it is, even the stuff that doesn't make sense and just because it's in there doesn't mean God condones it, like slavery and incest and rape, all that stuff's in there. That doesn't mean he condones it. It's just telling the story. And uh, 
This is not God tempting Jesus. I want you to know that. You know, Jesus even prayed, lead, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Satan is the one that targets you. Satan is the one that tempts you. God does not tempt you, but he will allow you to be tested, to prove your faith, to test your faith, to grow your faith. Because if you never face anything that you need to overcome, when the battle finally comes to your doorstep, you're just going to roll over. You know, turn belly up. You know, imagine, imagine being a baby and instead of your parents helping you walk and lifting you up and guiding you and pushing you to try to walk, now you find yourself as a grown man relying on the government and relying on everybody else to take care of you because you don't know how to do anything. And while that might be socially acceptable in some places, I almost said a state, but I'm not going to because we love everybody. I can promise you that you are never going to meet any girl that's worth anything. You're never going to amount to anything. And your life will be completely meaningless because it is full of the wrong kind of weakness. Men, you are called to be providers, guardians, leaders. You should be leading your household. You are not a mom. You can't be a mom. And uh, you're not meant to be a stay-at-home mom. You're supposed to be out doing something. We're not meant to live off of our parents or the government. We're meant to be doing things and providing for our families, leading the household. And I want you to see what happened immediately before Jesus is tested in his faith, because the temptation comes suddenly. It comes suddenly in Jesus's life after uh, it's suddenly the greatest in his life. And it comes suddenly when he gets tested after he has made his public declaration of faith. So uh, I think this is, this is Luke 4, Luke 3, he gets baptized. It's also in Matthew 4, Matthew 3, he gets, he gets baptized. And Jesus makes his public declaration of faith. The Holy Spirit descends, descends on him like a dove, fills him, and now the temptation comes because the devil doesn't care about you until you stop being devoted to his destruction because he wants to destroy you. The devil hates you. The devil hates you. The devil hates you. He wants to destroy you. He will put stuff in front of you and try to have you walk on a path that sounds good and looks good and feels good. He hates you. Right. He knows he's going to hell for eternity. And guess what? He wants you there with him. Right. And I know uh, life can seem a little bit easier without Jesus. It can seem easier without faith. It can seem easier without those things because once you have the transformation of the Holy Spirit, you are now also a target. Your transformation brings your target. Because when you are living in the world, and, it, and it's not perfect, it's not going to be perfect until it's remade, it can seem easier than the Christian faith. See, if anybody ever told you this was going to be easy and all your problems are going to go away as soon as you say, Jesus, you're my Lord and Savior, they're wrong. They lie. If anybody said it was going to be easy to follow Jesus, they're wrong. They lie. Terrible sales pitch, I know, right? Like, hey, come on. This is good. Jesus loves you. But now life is going to be really hard. But when you begin to be transformed by the Holy Spirit inside of you, the devil suddenly wants to focus more on tormenting you. When you're going his way, when you're going his way, he will leave you alone. This is why it's easy to go out and get drunk every Friday night and go out every Saturday night and get drunk and then you skip church on Sunday morning because you're sleeping in until 2 p.m. watching Netflix, uh, nursing a hangover because you thought it was great. And then you're spending the rest of the afternoon dreading Monday coming to go to a job that you hate to where you suddenly start count counting down back till Friday to when you can go back out. Right. Too real? I was there. I ain't judging because I know how it is because it's easy to sin. It is easy to do the things that stain your soul. Right. It is super easy. And while it feels great for a time, the older you get, the more you're going to realize just how much it's killing you, just how much it is leaving you empty inside, how empty it is making you feel, how dead inside it is making you feel. You're going to start to see that because you have just been distracted by the devil for so long. This is why it is so important to be daily with Jesus. If you remember last week, I, I, I talked about being daily just right at the, the very end. This is why it is important to share Jesus daily. Because whether you are sharing something that we put on the internet or just sharing a Bible verse from your phone or a reel or a message from somewhere else, anything, as long as you're still planting seeds, that's what's important. Because I guarantee you the people on your friends list, they're still watching your every move. They might be silent right now. You'll notice 
that as long as you're doing everything you can with them and going out with them and bar hopping with them and cheating on your wives with them when you go out of town, uh, as long as you're doing all that, you'll have all the friends in the world. And the minute you start coming to church and posting about Jesus, suddenly your Facebook is uh, like an old Western movie and there's just the little tumbleweeds blowing through and nobody's <laughs> counting or commenting on your stuff anymore. And that is why this story of Jesus in the wilderness is so important because he gives us the perfect example of resistance, of overcoming temptation. And we know that as soon as Jesus uh, got baptized and gave his public declaration of faith, that's when the temptation comes. But also, look when it comes in verse 2. For 40 days. I used to read this, and I thought that he was getting tempted the entire time. I didn't realize that, and it was after the 40 days. At the end of them, when he was hungry, after fasting for 40 days. I don't know if anybody has ever done fasting. Like I said earlier, I fast on Sunday mornings just to feel and get closer to God before I come up here. And even when I'm not preaching, I still like to fast just to be closer to the Holy Spirit, to be closer to Jesus. So after 40 days, you know he's hungry. We've been in here for, for, for 40 minutes. And I know y'all are hungry. You're like, all right, when's he done so we can go to Texas Roadhouse? His body would be weak, right? If you go any time without food, your body is weak. And then the devil comes in. He doesn't come in when you're strong. He comes in your moments of weakness to wage war at you. He's not coming when you're strong. He's not coming when you're prepared for it, when you're looking for him. He's coming when you're struggling, when you're starving. He's coming when you're lonely and you're looking for love in all the wrong places. And now suddenly there's all the ads popping up on your Facebook and all the other stuff trying to get you to go to a website that you know you're not supposed to, to go looking at things that you know you're not supposed to be looking at because those things don't belong to you. Things that you think need to fill a hole inside of you. But the problem is the more that you go to the world, the more empty that you begin to feel because you don't get anything from the world. It only takes from you. It only takes from you. So the devil said to him in verse three, that is the, the, the first test is the, the lust of the flesh. If you're the son of God, tell the stone to become bread. He knows Jesus is hungry. He wants him to use his power to be self-sufficient. He's tempting Jesus to seek immediate comfort, immediate gratification, because he's hungry. 40 days without eating, and he's hungry. And we're starving right now because we haven't eaten anything. But what if it's something else that you're dealing with that is leaving you empty inside? You might have already had breakfast. Maybe you already checked if the barbecue truck was open and you snuck a little snack in while we were all singing to Jesus. So you're full, but you're still feeling empty because maybe you've been single for the last six months and you've been doing good and you're focusing on the right things and you're coming to church consistently. But now your ex has popped back up in your DMs talking about, I miss us. <laughs> uh-huh. I miss us. Honey, he, he don't miss you. He misses what you were giving him until you realized he wasn't worth anything and kicked him to the curb. And now he's ran around town and everybody else found out that he's got nothing to bring to the table. So he wants to come back to you for what you were putting out on the table. Welcome to family church. So what do you fall back on on these moments? When the enemy has waited for your weakness, he has waited for you to get weak. And now he's waking you up in the middle of the night with things that you are not supposed to be doing. But it felt good to feel wanted for a minute and to feel loved for a minute. And now it is important for you to be reminded that your worth is not found in a weak man. It is found in one man and one man only. And his name is Jesus. He is the only one who truly loves you. He is the only one that will truly heal you. He is the only one that can truly fill you. He is the only one that will ever love you the most. He is the only one that will never let you down because he is too busy lifting you up to higher levels, to higher standards, to a higher way of living. He is lifting you up for due time. To walk in the purpose that he has for you. This is why in, in, in this same story in Matthew, he says, we don't live by bread alone. We live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. How fitting is it in this situation that the bread of life, that Jesus, the bread of life is saying we're not supposed to meet, uh, to live by bread alone. 
We are meant to live with the bread of life, with the word of God. Jesus is showing you, you are not supposed to do it on your own. You're not meant to try to be your own savior of your own life. He is not wanting you to try to be self-sufficient in your life, to be self-sufficient in your faith, because it is his grace that is sufficient for you. It is not mine, not your grandma's, not your uncle's, not your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your teacher in high school, not your gym teacher. It is Jesus's grace, his grace alone. It is his grace that wakes me up every morning. It is his grace that puts air in my lungs. It is his grace that orders my steps that provides for my needs, that saved me, that lifted me from my pit, that set me free. It is his grace that gives me the gratitude for this life that he is allowing me to live, that he is blessing me to live. Y'all need to take about 24 seconds for 2024 and give God a shout of grace and show him a little bit of gratitude for everything that he's done. He's going to come all of a sudden, but you should be shouting him while he's on the way. And maybe you think it's not really a big deal to thank God for another day. But if you ever woke up after ODing, you'd be thankful for waking up another day because you didn't think you were going to see one. We have got to get back to being more thankful for the things that are in our life, for the people that are in our lives. You could be stuck in a terrible situation, but if you take just a few minutes and remember the things that he has already done for you, that he has already delivered you, you will be suddenly filled with joy. And if you start showing a little bit of gratitude, it will compound on itself and you'll find something else to be gracious for. And then you'll find something else to have gratitude for. And then you'll find something else to have gratitude for. If you ever thought your lights were about to turn off and God showed up, you've got something to be thankful for. If you thought the car that's always dying on you and it's been running on fumes since Friday, but you still got here to church this morning, you've got something to be thankful for. If you thought your kids were not going to come back home because you don't know where they've been staying for the last week and a half and suddenly they showed back up on your doorstep, you got something to be thankful for. There is all kinds of things to be thankful for and it is time to get back to showing a little bit of gratitude. To be thankful that we're not supposed to live by bread alone, by every word from the lips of God, from the mouth of God, from the word of God. Because if I try to do it my way, my way sucks. If I try to do anything on my own instead of walking where God is leading me to, it is never going to turn out right. Ever. It's going to be broken and bitter and full of anger. But he saw me in the wilderness and decided to pull me back into his arms. The temptation of the flesh, wanting the immediate, seeking the immediate instead of relying on God for his grace. The second temptation, the lust of the eyes. The devil took him to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. He showed him. The devil is tempting him here. He is tempting Jesus to skip the cross, to skip the suffering to take the quick route to try to try and be the Messiah because this would be the route to skip the cross. You need to know Jesus was not afraid of the cross. The devil was because he knew it was his defeat. It was death's defeat. It was hell's defeat. Jesus was not afraid to go to the cross for you. The devil was afraid for him to get there. That's why he wanted him to skip it. So the lust of your eyes to see things that you don't have and to desire them, to skip over the things that God has already given you and to focus on the things that he has not given you yet. This is how so many people get trapped by the devil. This is how you get the the star on the sidewalk, to have your name up in lights, to be on a stage playing and singing at a concert and everybody's lifting their hands symbolically or literally idolizing you to the point of worship. This is putting yourself or anything else in the place of God's throne. This is why Jesus says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Only God is meant to be first. God is meant to be your first focus, your first love. And the problem is that now we have so many things fighting for our attention that we can mistakenly end up making God the lowest on our priority list. Your job can become your God. 
Your spouse can become your God. The person you're dating can become your God. The gym can become your God. Your eating habits, your money, your house, your possessions, your shoes, your TV shows, anything that you are putting before God and spending more time on is now your God. Little G, because there's only one that's worthy of having the capital G. You are spending way more time and energy on anything other than him. That's flat out showing him and telling him that he is not the most important thing in your life. And I'm not saying to suddenly throw out all your responsibilities and throw out your relationships and don't have any hobbies and don't watch any TV and don't go any to the baseball or football games or whatever. I'm not saying any of that. God has given us a wonderful existence where man is able to create things that we can enjoy. We don't worship the things. We worship the God that allowed us to make these things and do these things. God has given us a, an awesome existence to share it with friends and family full of love and laughter to make memories. But sometimes we get focused on doing all this stuff. We forget to spend any time in scripture. And the devil is great at distractions. You have your phone where you can get the Bible app on it. And as soon as you open it up, suddenly Facebook and everything else is throwing notification after notification at you, trying to get you to swipe away. And even if you don't, it's still distracting and will pull you out of the moment. Because your body can be present in something, but your mind won't be. Trying to get you to swipe away. Trying to get you to walk away from the word of God. If you have something in your life right now that is distracting you from your devotion to God, it is time to delete it. To delete your distractions. Whether that's Facebook or YouTube or Christian Mingle, whatever it is. If it's a distraction, it will be a temptation to spend more time in it than with God. And... I brought this up today because these are so great. The phones are so great. I used to have to work out of town all the time. I spent four months working on the other side of Florida, and I'd have to leave the house early Monday morning, stay in the camper, and then come back Thursday night. And uh, that was incredibly miserable. Yes, I was providing for my family, but it was absolutely terrible to be away from them. Uh, but the great thing with technology is that I could FaceTime them at any moment that I wanted to see them or that they wanted to see me or that they wanted to bother me when they know that I'm busy and they want to keep ringing the phone. <laughs> They're so great. And I can write down reminders on here that I'm going to forget and never look at again. And I'm going to make a checklist that's not on the home screen. So I'm not going to see it and I'm going to forget because I got distracted. And now, instead of carrying the Bible around, this big book or a little pocket edition, we've got everything on our phones. Anything that you want to imagine that you can access, any commentary, I've got logos on here with the Bible app so I can access commentaries and different studies and cultural backgrounds and all that fun stuff that doesn't excite y'all at all, but I get into it. And I can access any of that in a split second. And yet less than an inch away from you version, I can open up Google Chrome and go to any address that God does not want me to look at. I can go from looking at scripture to looking at sex in less than five seconds. As great as technology is, there is still those distractions for you. Satan wanting to distract you, to, to get you to look at everything he can to rip your soul apart, to stain your soul, everything that he wants you to look at, to be distracted from your devotion to God. He doesn't have to take me to a high place like he took Jesus to get me to start looking at a kingdom full of junk. All he's got to do is put a thought in your head. All he's got to do is put a picture in front of you because he knows what your temptations are. He knows how you stumble. He knows what he can use to get you to not focus on God. He knows what he can put in front of you to get you go down a rabbit hole until you feel completely disconnected from God and you start to feel guilty. And then you're promising him that you're never going to do it again until tomorrow. Until the next time he starts sending comments coming in your low place. The next time that you've stopped looking for God or maybe God is now allowing you to be tested in order to see your faith. Perhaps he is wanting you to grow. He is stretching you to grow because 
I think it's important to not just focus on your failures. Don't focus on your faults. Don't focus on the things that you still stumble over. Because if something, you used to spend five days doing something every single day where it was routine, and now you're only doing it two days, are you still failing? A little bit, yeah. You're still stumbling. You're still falling short. But it's important, I think, to celebrate the fact that you're already making progress in the right direction, actively trying to avoid it. It's like smoking. I don't smoke and haven't smoked, but I've heard that you cannot just quit cold turkey. You have to take different kind of steps. You can't just throw it away. Can God allow you? And will he move through you in order to do something like that? Of course. But nothing worth your time ever comes easy. If God just instantly removes something from you, you're going to think that you did it, not him. So he's stretching you to grow because eventually you're either going to grow enough to become strong enough to move out from under the weight that is crushing you or you're going to succumb to it, to it and stay weak and it's going to crush you because you don't even want to try anymore. That's why I love this one deals with the fact that you need to worship the Lord your God. Jesus' response, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus is hungry in the wilderness, in a dry place, talking about worshiping God. Y'all are hungry, thinking about burgers, not blessings. You're thinking about steak, not the Holy Spirit, especially now that I keep bringing it up. But how many of you can testify that you have been in a moment where you didn't know what else to do, and you were in a dry moment, you were in a dry place, in a wilderness moment, in the wilderness, and you were hungry for God, and you were trying to serve him the best that you could, but the devil kept throwing every distraction that he could at you, and you're wondering what exactly to do next, and you didn't really have any other thought other than to put on some music, to start to worship God, because the next best thing that you could think to do was to lift your voice. The next best thing that you thought to do was to start singing a song and start giving God a shout of praise because the situation looked too pathetic and it looked too pitiful and the devil was getting too distracted and the voices around you started getting too loud. But where he told you it was pathetic and where he told you that it was pitiful, you started to remember that God is all powerful. He is all present. And you remember that God said, don't read the comments. You remember that you're not going to see the wind. You're not going to see the rain, but your drought is going to end all of a sudden. Everything will change. And you remembered another song that you started to shout and you started to sing about how praise, how your praise went outnumbered, how your praise went surrounded because praise is the water. My enemies drown in praise is a weapon it's more than a sound my praise is the shout that brings jericho down is there anybody in here that can testify with me for about 30 seconds and shout at the devil because you've got something that you need him to shut up about because you need him to hear your roar again he needs to hear the lion inside of you he needs to remember who is inside of you the lion of the tribe of judah because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world Y'all are getting there. I'm going to get you to wake up someday. If I can do that and then come out here and yell at y'all for 45, 50 minutes, you can shout for 30 seconds. Mm, Because you're going to be doing a whole lot of it in eternity. Jesus, I'm sorry, Satan finally takes Jesus to Jerusalem to test him to use his power for unwise choices unwise choices giving us the picture of us living recklessly and expecting God to show up every single every single time that our bad decisions get us in a situation that we need rescuing from oh it's so quiet in here how many uh, 3 a.m saturday mornings have you spent praying to the porcelain bowl telling God just make it stop and he's like i'm not the one that made you take 14 shots And Satan is tempting Jesus to draw attention to himself, to make a spectacle out of the situation, going up to the high place, throw yourself down, and they will catch you. Jesus didn't need to prove anything at all, ever. He was already approved. He didn't have insecurities like we have. Needing to show off and post all your gym selfies and your bikini photos, 
letting others see everything about you because you need some type of validation. And we keep posting things on the internet, fishing for comments. All the wrong comments. Hoping that somebody's just going to give us a little bit of attention because we need validation. And we keep going to the wrong place for validation. Seeking comments for our comfort. See, when I see people's comments about me, I can shake it off because they don't matter to me. You don't pay my bills. Amen. Hmm. I don't care. I have a wonderful thing where if it doesn't matter to me, it's like, that's probably why I don't text some of y'all back. I'm just kidding. <laughs> a lot of times y'all do that thing where you, re- you look at a text and you respond to it in your head, but you didn't. And then like three weeks later, you're like, I need to see where this person's at. And you're like, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Other times, take that statement what you will. Other times, it's just if I don't want to respond, I'm not going to. Because it just doesn't matter to me. I, I, don't, I don't need to waste my time on some things. My, uh, you know, it's, what is it, Nehemiah? The work is too great for me to come down. But if that comment comes <laughs> from someone that I love, it can take on a whole different meaning. Kelsey? <clears throat> what? If I go to someone that knows me, what they say will matter more than what Joe Blow says on the internet. If I go to Kelsey and she says I did a terrible job on a sermon almost every week. I'm just kidding. <laughs> None of them believed it. But if I already feel bad about it, there was the, I forget the sermon I did recently and the altar was slammed full of people and everybody was like, that's the best you've done. And if y'all watch the family room, which most of you don't, but you need to because you're missing out on a whole lot of extra stuff every Wednesday at 6 p.m., shameless shout out. Uh, When I walked off the stage, the first thing I did was immediately go straight through that door and I wanted to hide because I felt just terrible about it. I was like, that was the worst thing. I don't know what it was. There was just whatever. But that's God's way of showing it's not about me. Not that I believe it's about me, but it is about him, showing him the glory, pointing, pointing people to him. So what I thought was the worst, a lot of other people enjoyed it because they needed to hear it. So if, if she said that I did a terrible job and I already felt bad about it, I'm going to feel worse. Just like if you read something nasty about yourself on the internet and it's already an insecurity that you have, Suddenly, it has become a nagging feeling that you can't shake. But if I feel like I did a bad job, and I'm throwing a pity party, and I'm the only person that got invited, and I felt like I did a bad job, and I go to Kelsey, and she says, that was the best one you've done yet. That came from someone that knows me, that I care about, that I love. And suddenly that has a whole new meaning. And the devil has been at you for all of this time, throwing comment after comment after comment. And since you're looking for validation, you have gotten stuck in the comments, walking around with all the crap in the crowd and all the comments are saying, all the distractions that the devil keeps throwing at you. And one of them was the fact that I just said the C word and you don't like that. Distractions. Jesus hung naked on a cross and got beaten for your sins. If words scare you, you're focusing on the wrong thing. You're circling around the carousel of comments. But God wants somebody to know. God is telling somebody, don't read the comments. He wants you to know that they didn't make you, so they can't define you. The devil didn't make you, so he can't define you. He wants you to know that I am the one who formed you. I am the one who set you apart. I am the one who created you. I am the one who loved you before you even had a body. So it doesn't matter what they say about you. It doesn't matter what the devil wants to tell you. All that matters is what God says about you. And he says you are fearfully and wonderfully 
wonderfully made. He says you are called and you can't cancel what God has called. He says you are loved. He says you are free. He says you are bought with a price and you have already been made perfect in his sight. So quit focusing on the faulty people. Put your attention on him. Put your attention on his comments, what he is saying about you, because since the devil is fighting for your attention, it is your decision if he gets it. Because you can get distracted by the devil and miss what God is wanting you to see. And what is he wanting you to see? He wants you to see that you are made for more than a nine to five, made for more than just raising kids. Made for more than just going to work, going to the gym, getting a milkshake and going home. You are made for more. You have authority to cast out demons, to heal the blind, to heal the sick, to make the dead rise. You have the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ in your body. And it is up to you to start using him because he wants you to. You are created to do something to show him off. God has a purpose for you and he wants you to see it. He wants you to grow into it, but you keep getting stuck and distracted by the comments. We have several more this week. Super fun for me to see him. I love it. It pops up and they're like, did you see this? I'm like, oh yeah, I did. It's great. I don't even remember what it was and I didn't write it down, but what I did write down was my wife's lovely comment back to it in a text thread, not, not publicly. And I've edited out all the bad stuff that wasn't in there. Y'all like, Ooh, (laughs) she said, "Mm, the biggest thing is they just want that attention because they're they're lacking in so many different areas of their life. So this is the only way where they can feel some type of validation by starting an argument. So if you don't give it to him, you literally already automatically win. So when you ignore them, it makes them realize that. (laughs) Nope. Uh, (laughs) When you ignore them, it makes them realize that even on the Internet, they are insignificant. Mm. I promise you, she's not a mean person. But <laughs> where the comments don't bother me, it bothers <laughs> them two jokers that are exactly the same. That's your long lost daughter right there, Dad. This ain't Alabama, so. <laughs> and I'm not Abraham. But <laughs> she said, Good Lord, Holy Spirit, come back in the building. Forgive me, amen. Bottom line. You're not going to win with them because they are actually not looking for the right answer. They're just looking for an attack. So you could be the most right in the room and it doesn't even matter. When you going to preach, girl? You say never. I said never, too. You said you weren't going to marry a pastor's wife either. But hey, here we are. How do you win? You don't give them attention. I'm great at it. You need help. Come to me. I'll help you out. All you got to do is this. Oh, I wasn't even doing that intentionally, but hey, that was good. That was, yeah, that was totally my plan. Focus on Jesus. I was just letting y'all get uncomfortable for me just being silent and turning my back on you. Notice, though, back in the garden. The devil initiated the conversation with Eve. Now, I know we give Eve a lot of flack. And uh, we hate on her, you know, because all sin came because of Eve. Where was Adam? Because he should have been tending the garden. They were made in full maturity, but they were still only a day old. They also, there was no sin yet. So... It's easy to be tempted when you don't have a template that shows you what it looks like. The the, the serpent came in and tempts them with something that they have never seen before. They've never heard before. All they have done is dwell with God in perfect harmony. They've never heard a lie. They don't know what a lie is. So they think everything is truth. But 
she starts responding. And some of our biggest problems with temptations with the devil, by the devil, in the comments that the devil makes is that we keep responding and not resisting. We keep responding and not resisting. In James 4, 7 and 8, if you can put it on the screen for me, please. Y'all give it up for our wonderful media department. They got to put up with me going through so many different scriptures. He says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God. And he will come near to you. Jesus was fully submitted to God's will and word. And that is how you resist. Staying in the word, submitting to the will of God, come near to God and he will come near to you. Do you see how Jesus resisted the comments? Do you see how he resisted the temptations? Get ready because I'm going to put you through the ringer. Can you put verse four back up on Luke? It is written. Verse eight. It is written. Now, verse 10. This is the devil talking. For it is written. For it is written. Do you see the devil's tactic? He uses twisted scripture, not twisted sister, twisted scripture. He uses the word of God out of context to tempt people to tempt you because if you don't know enough about the bible you will watch a facebook reel and think that jesus wasn't named jesus because the letter j wasn't invented yet and you'll believe all this other insane stuff and they'll say that the trinity isn't a real thing and all of these crazy things and if you don't stay in the word of god you will be tempted to believe it instead of doing the research for yourself it is okay to question things it's not okay to just accept everything and that's a whole sermon in itself and i'm not going to go on any kind of rant but the devil uses twisted scripture jesus uses the truth of scripture he says it is written it is written it is written jesus didn't wait for the day that the temptation come to start looking through the bible and see What can I say? What can I respond with? He stayed in it and he knew it enough to pull it out like a sword when he needed it immediately. That is why it is vital to your victory to continue to walk daily with Christ, to stay in your Bible daily, to be led by the Holy Spirit. Do not resist the Holy Spirit. By staying in the word, you will have something to resist with. You won't fall into the trap of having a conversation with the comments. You won't start talking with the devil. You'll start talking scripture at the devil because you telling the devil to stop isn't going to make him shut up. You wielding the word of God like a sword and using scripture like a sword is what shuts the devil up. Because when you know the truth to use against the twisted lies he throws at you, it is written. It is written. The Greek verb, and I'm, I'm getting close. I'm sorry, I'm a little extra today, but I like to give y'all some Tupperware to take home. And it's important. It's so important. The Greek word, verb... For it is written, is in a tense. Oh, this is so good. This is so good. It is in a tense that is both a completed action and a continuing state that results from that action. So in reality, the full force of it is written in Greek is saying it has been written and it still stands written. And I don't know if anybody was here last week, if you heard something about standing. I don't know if you heard something about standing because the devil is going to try to make comments towards you. He is going to be making comments at you. He is going to make comments against you. But I stand on the word of God, the firm foundation. He has never failed me. He has never failed you. He is never going to fail you. 
Your faith is not built on sand. It is built on the solid rock of Jesus Christ who shed his blood for you and me to be free. That is why the devil is afraid. That is why he flees. He is not impressed by your status. He's not intimidated by what you know. He is intimidated by who you know. He is afraid of someone bigger than him. He's afraid of the one who has all the real power. We had a few days ago, I think we were coming back here to the church and uh, all the girls got ready and Kelsey, Carolyn and Myla, they all went outside and Riley, and I'm tying up, y'all can come up. Riley was still getting something ready. She hasn't been feeling well, so she was taking her time as usual. She's only six. But mom and Myla and Carolyn, they already headed out the door. Riley heard the door shut She immediately sprang up, losing her mind. Wait, 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 wait. She thought that we were leaving her. She ran a room. She grabbed something and she came back. She saw me standing at the door, but it didn't calm her down. She changed her mind. So she ran back. She was like, I don't want this. Hold on. She ran. She got something else. She came back. She came to me and was worried that we were going to leave her. And I said, uh, baby, I don't, I don't know what you're worried about. They're not going to leave. She's like, well, they're already outside. I thought everybody was leaving. I said, I'm the one with the keys. I'm the one that's driving. So while they're rushing to get out the door and they can go get in the truck, nobody's moving until I sit down in there and put the key in the ignition They got to wait on me because I'm the one that has the power in this situation. It is who you know that has the power in your situation. And God has got all the power. He's got all the power, all the authority. He's got the word that makes the devil flee. He's got the command that stops the comments. And guess what? He's already given it to you. Just like I had the keys, you have the keys to the kingdom. You have the authority that has already been given to you. You have the power that is already inside of you. You have already been given the scripture. You have already been given the spirit. He has already given you all that you need to resist the devil. Put verse 13 up. What's that say? When the devil had finished. When the devil had finished. When the devil had finished. All this tempting. He left him until an opportune time. Church. When the devil had finished, he cannot keep coming at you all the time. He can't keep making comments about you all the time. He can't keep tempting you all the time. He's only going to come when you're at your weakest, not when you're at your strongest. So if you are down and out right now and he is attacking you and giving you comment after comment after comment, trying to stop you in your tracks And tell you that you're not worth anything. And tell you that you're not going to amount to anything. And tell you that God's not going to use you because of your past. It is going to finish at some point. And he is going to have to leave you alone. He is going to have to flee you. He is going to have to leave you alone until the next time. It might not feel like it, but eventually he has to get done. Maybe you're in the season that he is attacking you. And maybe you're in the season he is fleeing you. But either way, you've got to stay in the scripture to stop reading the comments. In order to flee, in order to make the devil flee and resist him, submit to God. Draw near and he will draw near to you. And he is coming The drought is about to end. We have been clearly dealing with the Holy Spirit so much lately. And I don't know why he shifted the message that I thought was supposed to be. And I hope it's it's 
spoke to you like it spoke to me this week. But he is coming suddenly. He is coming suddenly. You have been praying steadily and he is coming suddenly. Don't read the comments. Don't focus on the devil. Don't focus on the temptations. Focus on Jesus. Don't even talk to the devil. What's that old song? Shout at the devil. Shout at the devil. Y'all so uncomfortable. I'm bringing up a world song instead of a worship song. Shout at the devil. Maybe you need to learn to shout at the devil and shout instead of shouting to the devil. You need to start having some scripture that you can shout at the devil and you can say it is written. You can shout. It is written. Hmm. Shout at the devil. Don't read his comments. Don't focus on his comments because they don't matter. He is the accuser. He is the father of lies. So every comment that he makes is not true. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Please. I pray that the Holy Spirit has moved in those who need to hear this, whether that is in the room, out of the room, or watching at a different date. Somebody, somewhere, needed to hear this. Somebody, somewhere, needed to know that they don't have to seek validation from man. Jesus was validated before he did anything for ministry. Before his first miracle, he was baptized and validated by God. He didn't work for validation. He didn't do miracles for validation. He did everything from validation. And his spirit lives in you. If you have accepted Jesus as your savior and opened your heart to him and you follow him, his spirit is in you. So what that means is you don't need to seek validation. You have already been validated. God has already validated you. He's already approved you. He's already loving you. And where you're focused on your past, he doesn't see a single spot, a single blemish from your sins because they have already been forgiven. And if you are here in this place today, and you want a peace that passes understanding, and you feel the weight of your sins, and you're tired of being tempted, and you're tired of being uh, accused, and you're tired of the lies, and you're tired of all the comments that people make, and you know something in you knows that you're meant for more, because it is within all of us. We have this deep yearning for Jesus. We know that we belong to Jesus. We know that our way, the world's way, is not the right way. That yearning is within everyone. It is, it is up to us whether we harden our hearts and resist it or whether we submit to Jesus. And in a moment, they're going to sing one more song. And I invite you to come. If you want prayer, if you need prayer, come to the front. Somebody will pray with you. But what you need to know is Jesus says you're worthy. Jesus says you are worthy. Jesus says you are worthy. He left heaven. He left complete perfection and power to come down and be fully man. Yes, fully God. But yes, fully man. He experienced every temptation that we have experienced and will experience. He has felt every pain that we have felt. He has experienced grief and heartache. He's experienced brokenness. He's experienced loss. Everything that you have gone through or will go through, he has already been there. And since his physical body is not here anymore, his spirit is. And that means no matter what you're going through, he is both in it with you and at the finish line for you. He wants to work through you and meet you at the end, meet you at the miracle, meet you at the breakthrough, meet you at the promise, meet you 
at the crushing of depression, at the defeat of depression, at the, at the breaking of your chains, at the breaking of your bitterness, at the breaking of your longing for man that doesn't want anything to give to you, that doesn't have anything to give to you. Jesus gave it all for you. And I want to lead us in a prayer today for anyone that is, is your first time saying it or you're coming back to Christ. Just know you are worthy. He says you are worthy. You are loved. You are complete. You are whole. You are his. If everybody can repeat after me if, the, if this is pulled at your heart. Heavenly Father, I give you my life because you gave me yours. <clears throat> Jesus, I thank you for your death and resurrection so that I may have life and life abundantly. I invite you, Holy Spirit, to come dwell within me, to renew me, to strengthen me, to equip me, to empower me, to embolden me, to set me apart for my purpose. Woo. Jesus, I make you my Lord and Savior. Mm. Come into my heart and transform me. I will follow you all of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. He wants you. He wants all of you. He wants all of you. He wants all of you. All of you and all of you. It's not exclusive. It is inclusive. Everyone is invited whether you don't like them or you love them. We are all invited into his kingdom. We are all a part of his kingdom. He has deemed all of you worthy and he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.